Microsoft has changed how they go through and do networks. They call them kind of the same thing that they always call them, internal, external, and private. But now what Microsoft does is they make it as a virtual switch. So what I will do is, is I will have what would be a, a network switch that's connected in here. I have a network switch that's connected here. And then I have a network switch that's connected here. Uh, these are going to be virtual switches, and we have to be able to support virtual switch extension. So let's talk about the different types of networks. The first one that we have is an external network. An external network means that these virtual machines can talk to each other, they can talk to the host machine, and they can talk into your local area network. So if you have computers that you want people in your network to be able to access, then you would set it up as an, an external network. If we go through and have an internal network, what the internal network does is allows the virtual machines on that host to be able to communicate with each other as long as they're joined to that same internal network, but it also allows you to communicate with the host machine. So if I need to uh, maybe manage this on a host machine, I can do that. Now the third option here we have is a private network. A private network, the virtual machines assigned to that private network can communicate with each other but nobody else can talk to them. The external networks can't talk to them and the Hyper-V host can't talk to them via a network. They're isolated. And what you will see in a lot of solutions is a combination of things. Let's say, for example, I have a SQL server and up here I have an IIS server and we don't want this SQL server to be exposed because the SQL server on this virtual machine has credit card processing information. So I keep it, com keep it completely separate. Then on this IIS server, I can put in a separate network adapter and this separate network adapter, it's a virtual adapter, that can be plugged into an external network. And so now the clients down here would be able to go to that web server via that network adapter. They would talk to that IIS server, but they're not going to be allowed to talk directly to that private machine or to that, uh, that SQL server because it's in a separate private network that nobody else has access to. So um, you can use this and a combination of these by putting in multiple network adapters to make it so that they are usable or you can have them completely isolated. What a lot of folks will use with private networks is let's say that I'm trying to get um, uh, Security Plus certified or Certified Ethical Hacker or I'm trying to get my Black Hat certification, whatever, and I don't want my virtual machines that I'm practicing all of my evil hacking attacks and worms to go in and eat the host machine or eat my, my regular local area network. I can put them into a private LAN, and in this private local area network, they only communicate with, with each other, and then I can use things like uh, PowerShell Direct, or I can directly go in via the, uh, the Hyper-V console and uh, control these machines and monitor them and see what they're doing. I can even go in and I can do um, uh, port mirroring where I mirror the ports so I can sniff the packets as they go through without having to worry about infecting my network with all of these different attacks. So let's go ahead and make some networks. I'm going to go over to my Hyper-V server here and we will fire off uh, Hyper-V server number five here. And let's go ahead and make some networks. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to show you all of the buttons and all the components and all the things uh, associated with it uh, in just a little while, but we're going to start off by showing you networks. Now, when you first install this, you're not going to have any networks, but if I go up into my uh, virtual switch manager, this is where I have all of my networks. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get my head out of the way so you can see all the dialog boxes here. I'll slide this over. Let me go ahead and make this full screen. A little easier to see. So it says we're going to do a brand new virtual network switch. And that's what they call it. And it's actually a really good name because that's what it is. But unfortunately, they called it networks for a very long time. So a lot of the documentation still calls it networks. In fact, the exam still calls it networks. They say Hyper-V networks, Hyper-V networks. And it is a Hyper-V network, but they do this by having a pretend switch that we plug into it. So if I go in and I say, hey, I want to do an external network, I would say create the, the virtual switch. We'll give it a name. I'll call this one out to the internet. And I go through and I specify uh, which network adapter that we want to have it on here. Now realize this is a virtual machine running inside of a virtual machine. If I went up to my, um, my primary Hyper-V server and I said, let's go ahead and do a, um, a switch manager. 
I have lots and lots of network adapters. So if I say create a new external machine, I could go in and I could grab all of these other physical network adapters that are in there. But I'm going to do this inside of virtual machines. That way, if you want to do this in labs, you can you have that opportunity. So we'll go ahead and bring this back up. And we'll do a full view on here. So I can say we want an external network. I can say allow the management operating system to share this network adapter. That means can the host machine use this network adapter as well as the virtual machines. Now, if I have a, a system that has multiple network adapters, one of the best practices is, is that you reserve one network adapter just for management, and then the other network adapters you can split and choose between the various virtual machines. But if I only have one network adapter, I can say allow the, uh, the guest or the host operating system to use that as well. I can also have single root IO virtualization. Um, I can also do uh, VLANs, and we'll talk about VLANs, virtual uh, local area networks where you can do VLAN tagging if you need to. Uh, but that's an external network. I can also create an internal network. And if I do an internal network, remember, the host machine and the virtual machines can talk to each other but it doesn't communicate outside of the network. So I would call this one an internal network, I-N-T-E-R-N-A-L, net for SQL, for example. And then I can even do private networks. With private networks, the host operating system cannot use the network to talk to the guest operating systems because they're, they're going to be uh, network isolated. So I would call this one a private network. P-R-I-V-A-T-E. And there's really not a whole lot of settings. It's just whoever I connect to that private network can communicate. If it's internal, whoever I connect to that internal network plus the host can communicate. And if it's external, whoever's connected to that external switch, as well as the host, as well as the rest of the LAN, would be able to go through and communicate. So that is how you would go through and you can make um, different switches. So we'll just go ahead and create our private. So I'll say apply. Then I will go ahead and make a, an internal. So we'll call this one internal. I-N-T-E-R-N-A-L for testing, for example. Boom. And now I have a, uh, an external right here. Oops, where did my networks go? Switch manager. So now I have a, uh, an external here. I have a uh, private and I have an internal. And there's not a whole lot of settings that are involved. You can do VLAN tagging if you want. Uh, and it's pretty much the exact same things. The only difference is, is if I do external, it'll say, can I uh, manage, uh, can I allow the management uh, console to use it? And also, am I going to do um, uh, virtual I.O. and routes and all that? Now, they do have some best practices. If I do have multiple physical network adapters, they do recommend that I do things like NIC teaming. This is where I can do, it's called bonding. I take multiple network adapters and I make them look like a bigger network adapter. Also, they have fault tolerance. That way, if one network adapter goes over and fails, you'll still be able to communicate on the existing network adapter. But they are active-active. Um, I also have the ability on this NIC teaming, I can plug these physical network adapters into separate physical switches. That gives me redundancy. So if the network switch happens to fail, I still have network connectivity. So that's, uh, that's available there. Uh, we can also go in and set up uh, bandwidth management. That way with bandwidth management, I can go in and I can set up, uh, set up a minimum and maximum amount of bandwidth allocation that's set up. That way other virtual machines, including the host operating system, isn't going to be sucking up all of my, uh, my network bandwidth. Because you may have line of business applications that get really busy, or maybe it's a website that you've set up and it gets really busy, and now it starts to consume all the bandwidth, and now the other virtual machines are going to be starved out. Uh, you can also set up virtual machine queues. With virtual machine queues, it allows me to take the information from the network adapter and drop it right to the virtual machine without having the host operating system have to process it. So you want to make sure it's available. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages over this over VLANs because with VLANs, I have to do lots of tagging and we have to peel the tags off and it's just easier to go through and create internal networks or private networks or external networks. And if I need to tag it, especially external networks, if I'm moving that into a VLAN environment where I am going to be, um, where I'm going to be using VLANs and VLAN queues and all this other stuff, I still can do VLAN tags. It's just that in internal and private networks, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go through and do the tagging unless, you know, I need to. 
Uh, but there's lots of features that are available for us. We have quality of service. That way we can have a minimum amount of network capacity. We can also have multiple queues. Uh, this allows us to have multiple queues per virtual machine and spread the traffic across the queues. This allows me to leverage multiple network adapters to provide access to a whole bunch of machines. Um, we also have what's called RDMA. RDMA is Remote Direct Memory Access. Remote Direct Memory Access uh, is also known as SMB Direct. This allows me to have very low resource utilization, but I can receive and I can send packets but I don't have to bother the, uh, the host operating system as much. Now, one of the problems is, is that we've had um, NIC teaming, where I can combine multiple network adapters, but NIC teaming in older versions of the Windows operating system didn't support remote direct memory access. So now what they have is what is called switch embedded teaming, set. With switch embedded teaming, it allows us to have um, a remote direct memory access, and we can also do virtual machine queues, and we can also do network teaming all into a virtual switch. And the way that you turn this on is you would go in and you would say new VM switch, you give it a name. Uh, this is the name of the virtual switch, it's not the name of the team. Uh, and then you just add the adapters and it will turn on switch embedded teaming as long as my uh, network adapters support it. That way we can bond all the stuff together and they're still going to be able to communicate. Now, another problem that you run into with these uh, networks is that they are separate networks. Now, if I have one set up as an external network, which I had, where do we have it here? Okay, so we have external. Uh, these already have access to the regular network, but if I have private or I have internal, I may want to have an interface that will hook into the LAN but I need to make it so that the, uh, the LAN and the physical switch that I hook up into will be able to deal with these MAC addresses. And there's a couple of ways that we do this. Um, one way that I can do this is I can use network address translation. So let me go ahead and show you NAT. So here we have a private network. So we have a SQL server and maybe we have an IIS server and they have their own internal network communicating back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. However, I want to set up a virtual switch that gives me access into the local network here, but notice that I have this IP address here, but this is a 10.5.7 network here. So I have to be able to uh, provide, let's say this machine here, with an IP address, and we use network address translation. Now, if you're not familiar with network address translation, you use it all the time, especially if you have things like cable modems, because you have private IP addresses and you have public IP addresses. And with network address translation, I can have assigned a single address here that provides access to all of these internal machines if I want. So I could have 30, 40, 50 machines in here and we can map them out into a single uh, address. And what I would do is I'd say new VM switch. In fact, let me get my head out of the way so you can see all this stuff. I can say new VM switch, we're going to give it a name, we're going to call it NAT switch 01, and its switch type is going to be network address translation. And then I tell it the NAT subnet address is 172.16. So I'm saying we're going to make a brand new switch, but it's going to have a public IP address that goes into the LAN, or a LAN available IP address, but it'll also be able to work inside the private network and it will convert it into this uh, information here. Now, uh, we have all the different commands in here. So here we create a brand new switch. We're going to say our NAT subnet address is 172.16.0.1. That is going to be the, uh, the, the NAT switch that goes into our private network. Then we will go through and we will say here's the IP address for the other side. That's going to be 10.5.7.15 and we're going to give it an alias. We're going to call it VEthernet NAT switch. Um, I can also go in and I can say external IP interface address prefix. That is my internal network. It's just simply saying this is the network portion. Um, I can also use this to do port address translation where I do uh, different port numbers if I would like. So we have uh, our internal IP address is anything on the network for external. And the internal address is going to be a dot two. And it's going to go from port 80 to port 80. But if I wanted to, I could say instead of port 80, we will allow it to come in on port 80, but then we're going to remap it to port 82. And one of the reasons that we do a lot of network address translation is maybe I have virtual machines that I'm moving from one network to another network, 
but I don't want to have to go through and reconfigure the networks. So maybe it has a 172.16 network and I'm moving it over to this other Hyper-V host that happens to be in a different physical network. So I could set up a NAT switch and it'll convert that 172.16 address into a 10.7 address, for example. And now it'll allow us to communicate, but I don't have to go through and reconfigure these machines. Also, if these machines happen to use uh, non-standard port numbers, I can have my NAT switch convert. So here I'm converting from port 80 to port 82 or 8080 or whatever port that I want. So it allows me to take these, uh, it allows me to take these virtual machines that may not have the right IP addresses for my network, put them onto a host, and then put them into their own separate network. But I can use network address translation so that people can go through and communicate with it.